time again for another one of our Q&A sessions from here inside the Big Tech Rush. You know, I think one of these times, I got to do one of these live. That would be kind of fun. Don't you think we could do like a live Q&A from here inside the shop? I could set up a big screen so I could see your questions come in. That would be kind of fun. Maybe I'll plan to do that sometime in the next little bit. So, but until then, you know the deal. Ask a question, I answer it. Send me, your email, send me your mailing address. I mail you out a sticker pack. Thanks you, thank you once again to everyone who's been buying stickers and patches and all that kind of jazz. We got more stickers coming. We got one being drawn up for the Colorado right now, which was the rig that I built out for Ultimate Adventure. So, without any further ado, we're going to jump right into it today. So here we go from Z Snow seven nine five nine. Unless you're from Canada, then it's Z Snow seven nine five nine. Ian, what is your opinion on the Kingpin sixty? versus the Super Duty Dana 60 or a custom 14 bolt front axle? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so for those of you that don't know, the Kingpin 60 would be uh, what would be considered like an old school uh, Dana 60 front axle, usually found in leaf spring vehicles. And it had king pins out of the knuckle, which meant instead of ball joints, it had a large, basically steel pin on the top. And the top was another steel pin with usually a plastic bushing, which most people replace with a bronze bushing over time. Um, it was kind of the staple of axles that we could get forever and ever. And it came in a bunch of different trucks. The ball joint 60 that has become probably the most popular is the Ford Super Duty front. Whether you go with the 99 to 04 or all the way up into the 05 and up, which is the newer ones. Those are obviously the newer ball joint 60s. And now apparently there's even a new 2012 and up Ford Dana 60 that is popular as well. Once again, the reason those are popular is because they're in a whole bunch of Ford pickup trucks over the years from 99 to today. And uh, those suckers pop up in junkyards all the time. So, oh, and then the other option is your custom 14 bolt front steering axle. For those of you that don't know, uh, I've built a bunch of those. That's what's in the front of the uh, YJ Big Tire Garage shop truck, which is a 14 bolt center section with some sort of Dana 60 outers or heavy duty one ton outer knuckles. You basically retube it, build it yourself or have it retubed and you use the 14 bolt guts and then you use the Dana 60 outer. So let's start with the benefits and drawbacks of each one and why we use them. So the Dana 60 early generation and the Dana 60, I would call it now generation, which would be that 99 and up, that ball joint axle, um, why do more people use the ball joint axles? Honestly, it's because they can get them. Uh, the Dana 60 Kingpin axles are incredibly hard to find. Uh, the axle tube diameter was a little bit smaller than the Super Duty stuff, not as strong because the trucks just didn't weigh as much back then. Those were mostly under uh, leaf sprung, uh, you know, first gen Dodges, uh, square body Chevrolets, stuff like that. So they're not as easy to find. Um, they are great if you are planning to run leaf springs in your rig because they have uh, the, the center section is offset far enough for that narrower frame. So if you're trying to fit it in something that you wanna run leaf springs and you need that center section offset a little bit further, it does make life a little bit easier. Um, but like I said, they are a little bit harder to find. Another issue with them is maintenance. Uh, the reason that OEMs got away from kingpins and switch to ball joints was because the kingpins do need regular maintenance. They need to be greased, uh, rebuilt if worn out. There's bearings in there that you can replace versus a ball joint is very simple. You know, just pump a little bit of grease in it, away you go. Uh, the kingpins do need to be taken care of just a little bit more than let's say a ball joint. Um, uh, the, the benefits between those two is not, that's probably about it really. Um, Ease of finding one, not really that easy to find the Kingpin 60. If you can find one nowadays, you kind of get excited about it. So more and more people lean towards the ball joint 60s, uh, which are a great axle. High pinion, both of them reverse rotation. Um, so that's another good thing about them. Um, 14 bolt center section, Dana 60 outers or custom front steering 14 bolt. Probably the biggest drawback to that axle is gonna be number one, low pinion. 14 bolt was only available in low pinion. Number two, that is a 100% custom axle all day long. Um, so it is a lot of work to build it. Um, is it strong? Yes. Is it stronger than a Dana 60 gear set? I mean, 
I get, you could argue that it is because the 14 bolt does have a three bearing pinion uh, to prevent ring gear deflection versus the Dana 60 only has two and it is a little bit smaller. Uh, but the 14 bolt, unless it's something you really, really want, or you have the skills to build it yourself, I don't really see a benefit to going to the 14 bolt versus the Dana 60. Uh, the ball joints, a lot of people don't like ball joint axles. I think that there are ways to increase the strength of those ball joint axles. You can get uh, rebuildable ball joints from companies like Dynatrack, which essentially are like a ball joint eliminator because it replaces the ball joint itself with a uniball. Uh, you can get full-on ball joint eliminators, which just replace the ball joints with really, really big bolts and uniballs. So you can kind of eliminate that weak link if you want. So get rid of the ball joint. Um, but in all honesty, unless, uh, unless you're really, really working it and putting really, really big tires on it, I really don't think uh, a ball joint failure is something that's going to be too common. Will they wear out? Sure. That if you are wearing out a lot of ball joints, then you might want to think about getting uh, some ball joint eliminators in there or some type of rebuildable ball joint like the Dynatrack ones. So really the benefits, uh, I would argue that the biggest benefit between the two is going to be ease of getting your hands on one for the price. So you're probably going to end up with a Dana 60 ball joint axle because it's going to be the cheapest and the most available, to, most readily available to find. Um, easy to get parts for, once again, Dana 60 front, probably that ball joint one because it's going to be very easy to get parts for it, whether that's axle shafts, unit bearings, a huge amount of aftermarket support for that axle, so that's great. The 14 bolt, that's just custom, 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 custom all day long. And in my opinion, if you're gonna go that route, custom, custom, custom all day long, I would honestly build a nine inch steering axle before I built a 14 bolt steering axle. I built the ones in the Jeep YJ shop truck just because I was doing it for Crawl Magazine and I was able to do that 100% myself. I used a bunch of junkyard parts and I was able to build a couple really cheap axles, both front and rear. But if I was, nowadays, if you're building that 14 bolt front steering axle, you're probably chasing strength. I honestly believe that the better way to do that is to not start with a 14 bolt, start with a fabricated nine inch housing, build a baller nine inch dropout, and then go with some sort of aftermarket knuckle like a spider tracks or a reed knuckle that is a lot stronger and then you're going to get all the benefits and probably shave a couple hundred pounds off that front axle. So unless you really, really, really want that 14 bolt front, I would go for a nine inch instead. So there you go. The diff my personal opinion would be get that ball joint, Ford axle, no big deal, easy to find, easy to find parts for, modify it to fit your project. Or if you really want that custom, custom axle, uh, I, would, I would say don't do the 14 bolt, do the nine inch. I just think that they're a lot better. Plus, if you really want to throw a lot of money at that nine inch, you can get high pinion nine inches, which are great. You cannot get a high pinion 14 bolt front axle. It's not gonna happen. So if you do go with the nine inch, even if you started with the low pinion, built the entire, here's another benefit to the nine inch axles. If you built the entire buggy or entire project around that nine inch axle and you could only afford the low pinion dropout and you put it in there, if two years from now you wanna to change to a high pinion, you can simply slide the third member out, get the high pinion uh, third member, bolt it in and you don't have to replace the axle. So you do have the benefit of that also with that uh, Ford 9 inch, which is also kind of nice. So there you go. If I'm picking between all those axles, all four of those, that's what I'm choosing. Ball joint 60, fabricated nine inch front, if I had to do it. Thank you for your question. Justin Schloud 9443, what do you use for trail communications? CB, GMRS, FRS, and Y. So, uh, honestly, on this side of the country, I use my cell phone. Um, I do have uh, VHF race radios in most of my rigs uh, because when I take them out west, I like to have that ability when I'm out west. Um, I think the GMRS is another good option. It's kind of just like a little bit better than a CB. You know, you do have some privacy in the channels, but not as much as VHF. I know there's a lot of arguments with the VHF about the legality of it and the ham license and all that kind of stuff. And I, I'm not gonna jump into that argument um, because I just don't want to. Um, I think that there's enough other things on our vehicles that probably could get us in trouble uh, about being legal uh, than the radio that you're using that particular day. 
So I would say probably half my vehicles will have some sort of uh, VHF or GMRS uh, communication system in it. But honestly, when I'm wheeling, nine times out of 10, if I'm wheeling on this side of the country, honestly, I'm using my cell phone because we have great cell service pretty much everywhere on the East Coast. Uh, if I'm out at Hammers or Moab, place like that, I tend to just use whatever radio everyone else is using. I kind of prefer just to have every tool in that toolkit. I kind of like having, you know, uh, uh, maybe a VHF handheld, uh, GMRS hard mount, cell phone, CB, you know, it really just depends on your group that you're wheeling with. Um, and that, that's more important, I think. I, I would say what's the most important thing is what your friends use, what, who you're wheeling with. Because if you have a, a race radio set up in your rig and no one else has race radio, what are you going to do? Uh, if you have GMRS and no one else has GMRS, what are you going to do? So I think you got to just stick with your core group of friends. Uh, me and my friends, we, a lot of us have similar, we have GMRS in some of our rigs that we take certain places. We have VHF in the other rigs, we take other places. And then, like I said before, locally around here, cell phone. And then also, to be honest with you, nine times out of 10, what do I use? I use my feet and my mouth because I'm out of the rig walking around talking. Um, we're not a group of guys that like are blasting through the desert or five miles from each other when we're wheeling. We're usually wheeling in a small group. And so when we're out and about, we can usually just lean out the window and talk to each other. So that's probably the most used form of communication is just us talking to each other. That answers that question. Question number three, here we go. Big shelter. My question has to do with shop safety. What is something that the average guy might not know? For example, I learned a few years back that using the wrong brake clean before welding is a big no-no. And that's a very good question. That's kind of a fun question because there's also an answer in there at the same time. Uh, so yes, when welding, you want to make sure that you are using non-chlorinated brake clean or better yet, just don't use brake clean on something you're going to weld. Prep your uh, weld surface with something that's actually designed for doing that. So get some uh, Blue Demon prep wipes. They're great. Uh, you can get some actual prep spray. That is great. Uh, or it's just, you know, basically thinner. That is also great as well. Don't use brake clean if you're going to weld something. But his question actually was, what is one thing about shop safety that most people don't know? And that is really, really kind of fun because I always say this to people when they're in my shop and they're working. I'll actually point this out. And when I was teaching high school, this was actually one of the questions on the Mr. Johnson shop safety test. And it was a great question. And I think to this day, I think even a lot of people who were asked this question, they wouldn't know the answer. And the reason I know that is because when people are working in my shop, they'll ask me for a cordless impact gun. And why do I have an air impact gun when there's so many great cordless impact guns out there? Which there are. There's a lot of, the cordless tool world has really kind of jumped into the automotive shop. There's so many options out there and a lot of guys love them. I personally, not a huge fan. It's personal preference. I feel that I can feel better with an impact gun versus a cordless electric impact gun. But there's also a shop safety reason why we use air tools in a mechanic shop instead of electric tools. And the reason why is a reason that a lot of people don't know. Air tools were developed for the mechanic shop and electric tools were developed for carpenters and home use. Not because we have a big giant air compressor because we have to fill up tires. We have air tools because when you're working in an automotive shop, you are in the presence of a lot of explosive vapors. Gasoline, diesel fuel, uh, automatic transmission fluid, brake clean as we pointed out before. And inside every electric drill or impact gun or air ratchet is a small electric motor that's developing heat, and in some cases, you can actually see the small sparks working on those motors, especially once you've thrown a bunch of metal shards or metal filings in there because you're working in a metal-rich environment like a fab shop like this. And so that is a safety thing that not a lot of people realize, that the reason that we have air tools in a shop is because that when you have an electric drill or electric impact, you are in the presence of explosive vapors with an item that creates sparks. So that's something that you might not know. So that's a little bit of knowledge that I'm going to share with you. Whether you choose to use 
The electric impact gun over the air impact gun, that's completely your choice. I am a fan of the air impact gun just because that's what I started with. And also, just another side note, when I was a teenager dreaming, dreaming of being a mechanic as I, when I grew up, the gas station that I had a summer job, which turned into a full-time, part-time job when I, all through high school, was across the street from a gas station that actually had a mechanic shop in it. It was a small little two-bay shop with a gas station. And then our gas station was a bait and tackle shop, which I was not a huge fan of fishing at the time, still I'm not. Um, so I used to sit at the bait and tackle shop and listen to the sound of the impact guns from that shop across the street and just dreamt, dreamt of one day being able to work in a shop and make that boo, boo, boo sound with the impact gun. And so that is why also I think one of the reasons why I love the impact gun. So there you go guys. Thank you once again for tuning in for these Q&A sessions. So now it's time for our Where Is It Now segment. And this Where Is It Now unfortunately does have a sad ending. So the truck we're gonna talk about is probably the one that gets asked about the most. And I really haven't done a Where Is It Now about it because it is a sad ending unfortunately to that truck. And the truck is the Suburban Gorilla. Now, if you don't know what the Suburban Gorilla is, just Google Suburban Gorilla Ian Johnson and you'll find like 9 million images and posts about it because the truck was, was pretty, pretty groundbreaking when we built it. Uh, so the backstory behind the Suburban Gorilla is I was lusting after that H1 kit car body kit from Urban Gorilla long before I was ever on television. I was teaching high school up in Canada and I was on the internet one day at home and I saw this Urban Gorilla body kit and I absolutely fell in love with it. I thought it was amazing. Um, you know, basically that sort of H1 style truck onto a suburban frame. And I think it's because I'm a VW guy at heart, which is kind of why I kind of think kit cars are cool because there's so many kit cars built out of VW. So whenever I go to a VW show, there's all these kit cars. And so I always thought they're kind of neat. Um, but the reality is that if you look at something, if you live in Canada and you look at something for sale in the States and you want to get it into Canada, by the time you dealt with the exchange rate, the shipping, fees at the border, you might as well take that part that costs $100 and by the time you got it in your lap, it's a $300 part. That's just the reality of it. So that body kit that I think at the time was like seven, dollars $8,000, by the time I could get it into Canada, man, I'd probably be at, gosh, maybe eighteen, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000, somewhere in that mark. And so it just really wasn't attainable for me at the time. You know, I was new family, just married. My son, I think, was one or two at the time. And that was really not the top of the list was to build a Hummer H1 kit car. So we fast forward a few years and now all of a sudden I'm in Tennessee and I'm making this TV show and the production crew, uh, the executive producer says, yeah, if you want to build a car for yourself, build a car for yourself. I'm cool with that. And so I was like, yes. That's what we're building. I'm building the Suburban Gorilla. So I immediately ran out, bought a 74 Chevy Suburban, called the guys at the Urban Gorilla Body Kit Company, and they were more than eager to send us a body kit because, got to remember, like I said, this is 2005. I mean, YouTube wasn't even really invented yet. It wasn't a thing. So you wanted your product in front of people. We were the guys to talk to, and so people were eager to uh, send us products. And so that body kit was like, boom, world stage right there on the show for everyone to see. Original plan was to put a GM Performance Parts 502 big block into a 4L80, but uh, the truck just seemed so popular. It just blew uh, out of proportion and it got so many first ofs ever that it was just another thing that made the truck super cool. It got one of the first ever standalone Duramax diesel engines under the hood from Gail Banks. Uh, th that just wasn't a thing at the time, but he had some prototype engines that he was working on for some other projects, and we were able to get our hands on one. First time ever an Allison transmission had been run in a standalone fashion behind that Duramax, and because of that, I was able to uh, make friends with someone who I still call my friend today, Braden Fleece from Fleece Performance. Uh, we are trying a bunch of different transmission controllers for that Allison that did not work at all. And uh, Braden actually saw the controller on the show and just 
cold messaged me, I think it was on Pirate 4x4, basically just said, hey, if you want that Allison to shift, I'll come down and fix it for you because I can make a factory Allison computer work with your standalone Banks computer and we had him come down and do it and it was awesome, that truck was great. Um, it was fun to drive. It really was more like a hot rod than it was a tow rig. I mean, it was a thousand horsepower, 18 pound feet of torque at the flywheel, uh, twin turbo Duramax, um, 38 inch tall tires on 20 inch wheels. It was just, there was a whole bunch of craziness about that truck. Looked super cool, was fun to drive, turned heads everywhere it went. And I'd drive it maybe once or twice a week just for fun. Uh, fast forward a few years into owning it and I wasn't really using it a lot. Like I said, maybe once a month I would take it out. The rest of the time it just kind of sat in the driveway or sat in the, in the garage and it just really wasn't being used. Um, what happened to the truck was unfortunate. So what happened was a friend of mine, very good friend of mine, called me up and he wanted to borrow it. He wanted to take it to an off-road event, not to go four-wheeling, he was just going to, I think it was basically a hill killing event, maybe a little bit of mud bog was in there. I think it was one of those hill in the hole type events. Early days of rock bouncing is when he wanted to borrow the truck. And he just wanted to load up all of his buddies. They were just going to drive around the off-road park and uh, just, you know, just have a cool way to get around. And, you know, he was a good friend of mine, still is a good friend of mine to this day. I would loan him any one of my vehicles, no questions asked, but he will not borrow one from me because of what happened. During the event, unfortunately, they were coming down a trail, not a hardcore trail, just like a road through the woods, and we still don't know what happened to the truck, whether it popped out of gear or something broke, but basically it went down a hill and it went down a hill incredibly fast, and his only option was basically steer it into the trees, which is what he did. The good news is nobody got hurt. Nobody was hurt. I think there was like six people in the truck, and they all just got out, walked away. The truck itself, unfortunately, was, I don't wanna say it was totaled, but it was pretty banged up. Now, my friend he called me the next day and he said, you know, hey, had a problem with the truck, I'm gonna fix it. No matter what it costs, no matter how long it takes, this truck will be fixed back to the way it was. What he didn't know was at the same time I had been having conversations about somebody who wanted to buy the truck. And that person and I were going back and forth about buying it. I really wasn't sure about selling it to him because like I said, it was kind of a crazy high horsepower uh, truck. And um, I just, I was feeling uneasy about just selling it to him uh, because he didn't build it. He didn't really know much about it. Uh, but uh, my gut told me that he didn't really want the truck. I think he just wanted the parts. So when the truck was in the accident, I called him up and I told him, I said, hey, here's the situation. This is what's happened to the truck. The body's damaged. I think it had a broken wheel. Um, I think a couple, a little bit of the glass was broken in it. The fiberglass front clip was damaged. I do know that. Body itself was fine because it was basically a tank. It was all steel, 16 gauge and 120 wall steel tubing. It really was kind of all held together and it was super, super strong. Um, anyway, I called the guy who was interested in buying it and that was actually the truth. He just wanted it for the engine, the transmission, and the axles. He didn't really want the truck itself. So when I called him and told him about the accident, he said, hey man, I'm, I'm parting this truck out anyway. So I'll give you the same amount of money. Actually, I, I took a little bit less wrong. He said, I'll give you a little bit less money uh, just to take the truck as is. And he didn't even want the title. He goes, I don't want the title because I'm just taking this thing apart. And that made me feel a little bit more comfortable about selling the truck. So I told my friend, I was like, you know what? Don't fix it. There's no point. Don't put that time and effort into it. This guy who's going to buy it, he's not going to give me any more money than he's going to give to me as it sits right now. So I think the best decision at this point is we just scrap the truck and part it out and we'll just call it done. Uh, to this day, uh, my friend who borrowed it and wrecked it, he still feels bad about it. I tell him not to worry about it. The most important thing is that nobody got hurt. And, uh, and in the long run, everything turned out fine. Uh, and I'm not joking. He's gone on a wheeling trip with us. And I have told him, I said, hey, do you want to borrow the, the shop truck? Just go ahead and jump in it. And he's like, no, we all know what happened last time I borrowed one of your trucks. So he will not borrow a vehicle from me. It's actually kind of funny at this point. Um, but I, I, I would, I would loan him one of those trucks again anytime he wanted to borrow one. Cause yes, the truck did die, but most importantly, nobody was hurt in the long run. So 
Unfortunately, that is the sad story of the suburban gorilla. I don't mean to end this video on a down note, but the suburban gorilla, unfortunately, is resting in pieces and it basically turned into a bunch of different trucks. I think the body was sold to a guy who built a mega truck. I know the engine and transmission and transfer cases ended up in a pulling truck. Uh, the axles ended up in a rock crawler. You know, it's just, it's one of those things. It happens. Uh, I, like I said before, I was just glad that nobody got hurt. It was a bummer because I loved the truck a lot. But at the same time, if I still owned it, it would just be holding down concrete somewhere in my shop to this point. It's one of those trucks that I think was super cool, but it, it wasn't gonna be a daily driver. I, it, just, it just wasn't. So, I'm sorry to end this video on a down note. Here, I'll pick you up right now. Here you go. For those of you who've been waiting for videos on the Comanche, we started to put the Comanche build series through its first round of edits. The show is looking really, really cool. We're kind of branding it as like the relaunch of that build series. Like I said before, the build series videos, we're doing something a little bit different. Uh, I don't really know how to describe what we're doing for it yet, but I know the destination. I just have to get the roadmap to get there. At this point, we're just looking at a couple different options for us. So the build videos are going to be coming back and it's going to start with those Comanche build videos. I also am going to be doing a build video on my bug and we'll also be bringing in the VW thing that I'm going to start working on once this Comanche is done. So those videos will be coming back. But like I said before, we're going to be treating them slightly different. But at the same time, all these vlogs and Q&As, we're going to still keep doing these. So thanks again for tuning in here in the Big Tire Garage. We'll see you next time.